on one slide from the other. So this is what happens when you don't submit the title of your talk on time. I make one up for you. Right. So <laughs> given that, I have to go with this. Uh, <laughs> so something. something so uh, why? Why too smart? Brian, why too smart? Because I know everything. No, it's really easy. Yeah. Okay, why? That's right. So I'll ask to my dear. Alexander, why do you smart and this laptop isn't? Um, because I can I can make connections without having to follow some sort of algorithm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is my guess. The, the reason we are smart, or some of us, or some of you are smart, is <laughs> that you can perceive and interact with your environment, and you can reason, and you can learn. So that's what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> Never mind. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so in our lab, which is called the Vision and Learning Laboratory, we have the goal of making computers smart. Of course, we're, we're not that ambitious; they will never be us. Smart as you guys. More specifically, you can never guess from the name of the lab, but our goals are to program computers to see and to program computers to learn. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we mean, especially about making computers learn. Then some results that people have from other groups, and, and then if I have time, what we want, I'll give you examples of. of uh, projects that we have going on in our lab. So, first I'll tell you what is machine learning, I guess. All of us have the intuition of what that may mean, and what is it good for, and, and then projects, ours and, and somebody else. So first, what is machine learning? So we know what learning is, but a more formal definition that I kind of like is this, the, the discipline that leads to the development of programs and systems and algorithms that, that can improve the performance <coughs> of a task with experience. That is, instead of programming a system to solve a task, you program it to learn from examples. And it receives the examples and it figures out how to solve the, the relevant problems. Why do we want machine learning? Any idea? Well, from a scientific point of view, if we uh, are interested in artificial intelligence, well, maybe the most important feature of intelligent behavior is learning. And that's nice, but that's really not, that's science. From an engineering point of view, we would like this to be useful for something. And it turns out that machine learning is very useful for three types of problems. The first one is self-adaptive uh, problems, problems that adapt to changing circumstances. And that's important if we can foresee all the, the situations in which a program will need to, to operate. So we can instead use the ability to learn. Data mining, data mining has to extract knowledge from huge amounts of information for uh, commercial applications, security, and so on. And the third kind of application, which is the one I like, is applications that are too difficult to program by hand. So th there are some problems that certainly can be solved by computers, but maybe we just too dumb to solve them. We're too dumb to, to write a program. Think, for example, of a program to, to find faces in an image. How would you go about doing that? Those who are in my class, if I gave you that as a lab, would you be able to do it? It sounds difficult and impossible. Right? And we humans do it so easily. How about uh, recognizing the spoken language? Well, it's more than the same thing. How about driving a car? How about driving? How about parking a car? How about the like, when you are nice bench without falling out? That's difficult even for some people. Handwriting. <laughs> 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 recognizing handwriting. That, that's another one. So I'll mention a couple of one application that I find extremely Impressive. Impressive. Application machine learning. So this is Stanley. Does anybody know who Stanley is? Who's Stanley? Uh, he's the vehicle that won. Um, he, he runs mostly off of all the software. And ran on a track that he was like 400 miles or something. Um, completely
Right, so this was the, the DARPA competition of the <coughs> three vehicles drove by itself from Kutia to Kamaruji. A number of miles, probably not 400, but certainly <laughs> over 100 in the desert here. Without people or computers? With computers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think computers are a little bit with it. How did they do it? Well, with machine learning, of course. How would you write a program for a vehicle to, to drive itself? So that's, again, extremely difficult. So this is what they did. They gave it lots of sensors, very expensive ones, lots of computers, and they drove it. So while it was driven, it was learning a mapping from perceptions, everything it sensors you see. It's a laser, it's a camera, it's a GPS, accelerometer, uh, it's numbers, this and that. And a person was driving. So it learned a mapping from the sensors to the steering wheel and braking and, and acceleration. Command. And this is one example of something that, uh, at least from the beginning, looked impossible in this sort of technique. Some other applications that maybe you've seen, commercial dictation systems, those use machine learning. You have to read to them, and they learn the mapping between your, your voice and, and the letters and, and the points you the same. The phase detecting cameras, does anybody here, here have one of those? Many people have it, right? Yeah. Think how did they do it? The camera doesn't learn anymore, but the, the program that is running there was built using machine learning. Lots of examples of phases, lots of examples of unknown phases, and they found a way to distinguish between the two, and they do it very perfectly, with maybe time and then very good accuracy. Another nice application that makes Netflix movie recommended. So who subscribes to Netflix movie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's this uh, thing where you're the movie. Amazon system. Right, right. Recommendation. Right, so based on the movies you've seen, Netflix will recommend movies that you are likely to like. And it's uh, surprisingly accurate. In my case, it's a lot better than my mother. <laughs> so, and then having a contest. If you can improve by 5% upon their, their system, they'll give you. It was a price, who remembers? One year subscription? No, not really. It was one million dollars. And you can do better than they do. And all the big machine learning groups, or several of the big machine learning groups in the world, were trying to you know, get that money. And another one that I like is, is a Lexus self parking car. You've seen those, right? So you just sit ne next to the car in front of the street, you, you want to park, and the car will by itself, part. And how they, they do they that? Well, also with machine learning. They have people, they have sensors all around the car, cameras, and stuff like that. And they have people part several times, and after doing that a number of times, they have a program, and then they just write that program into the, the car's computer, and, and then you can part on its own. Obviously, didn't have my ex-wife. Uh, <laughs> Part of the training. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you have to be careful. Although the or does the Lexus actually run into the car in front of the line? Right? So, <laughs> the well, the other other works. Works. so that's my question with Netflix. Is if what happens if you order Netflix movies and it turns out you don't like those movies? Does it like keep sending you movies that you don't like? <laughs> you always read it. Oh, you rate the movies then? Right. Yeah. Oh, Otherwise, it's magic, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You order a movie, when you return it, they ask to grade it from 1 to 5. And based on this grade, you're going to like this or not like that. Okay, so now I'm going to talk in the... How much do they have? Minus 1 minute? <laughs> okay, so maybe I'll get some time. Some other day. So nothing is as impressive as what I mentioned, but these are applications we have been working on in my research group. We've been using machine learning for each of those things. So we have vision, those people were here last week, heard a little bit about that. RNA folding, that's uh, to predict how mm, an RNA sequence binds with itself in the, in the real world. Phase detection, uh, similar to what I talked about with the cameras, that's the one we've been using this work. That we really based all these algorithms for the, the sound cameras. Transfer learning, that is, when you uh, <coughs> learn to solve a task and then you need to solve a similar task 
Could you take advantage of the knowledge you have from the previous stuff? And normally, learning systems start from scratch, and really that's not what, what humans do. Uh, if somebody wants to learn Italian, certainly somebody who knows Spanish is in much better shape to learn Italian than a person who only knows English. So we suppose the same thing has to be true for computers and actually uh, a student here working on this. Is the Spanish dissertation. Uh, we also have a project, a small project on detecting traffic signs from a, for example, from a police car. You could figure out if traffic signs are in good shape or, or destroyed on the line and so on. Simply by having a camera inside a car that is continually driving through the roads for some other reason. We have a database of where the, the signs should be. You could be comparing where uh, the, the location where you should see signs, where the, the signs you are probably seeing. Object detection, which is just an extension of object detection. Uh, no wonder I ran out of space. It's intelligent scale in grid computing environments. So, are people familiar with grid computing? It's like a uh, screensaver. You use the actual cycles of people's computers to solve really big computing problems. The problem with this is how to distribute the load. If I have 2,000 people telling me they want to participate in my project, who do I assign work to? Who can I trust? I can trust. Uh, there are um, faster and slower computers, some have uh, so, uh, predictable um, turnaround times, and so on. So, distributing the load becomes very, very difficult. So, we have a project here where we found a way to automatically design scaling policies for good computing. Also, detecting end of audience, we, when we have a spoken dialogue system where a computer is talking to a person. How does the computer know when it's turn to talk? How do you know when the person is done? And normally they wait for a few seconds. And there are better ways people know what for is when another person is done. This is a project on that area, not here. <laughs> and finally, machine learning for image enhancement. That is, if we have a very low resolution image, but <coughs> can we infer the high resolution image that corresponds to that low resolution image? Imagine that for security applications and things like that. And that's Jason's work. And I had 20 slides for each of those. So that would take me six or seven hours. So maybe I'll stop now and uh, answer questions. And hopefully, they will give me three more minutes later in the semester to talk about the And also, hopefully, the students will have an opportunity. I have a question. So, what would you say uh, is the main drawback of, a, of an ML approach? Like you mentioned at the beginning, which were the most suitable applications. Uh, what would be uh, some applications in which you couldn't use machine learning? The drawback of, of machine learning? When not to use machine learning? Yeah. If, if there's any other way to solve it, really. Mm -hmm. Can I write a program that learns to invert matrices? Sure, it's but why would I want to do it? There's an efficient algorithm mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, uh, Prone to learn to write a compiler, things like that. So, unless the, the problem is too difficult, it's probably not worth using. So the main drawback would be uh, that it's very that it takes a lot. I mean, in terms of computational. It, it can take a lot, right. but but not always. For example, the I can tell you this. So, to design a scale, uh, scaling policy, the IBM people took uh, four or five months. Our program takes four or five days. So, it's a lot of time for a program to run for five days, but it's, it's one drive I can also program can make mistakes. And if you have a method which is certified and uh, analyzed uh, mathematically, it will sure. make mistakes. Well, that is said Netflix. In the beginning, it gives you wrong predictions because you only a small sample, and then it does give you good predictions. Right, right. So it, it requires training. Yeah, that, that's another really good point. You require the, the training data. If you don't have training data, then, then it's impossible. If you have very little, and the more complicated the task, the more data you need. So imagine data you guys need. It was a lot. So that, that, that's a good thing. Any questions? I guess it depends on the parameter space too. 
the size of the parameter space of the problem. Right. Right. So Whether right, or not so machine learning. Right. Space. If the machine learning is practical. Right. You need them to be able to cover a reasonable fraction of the parameter space. That's one reason you can't write programs that learn to play go, for example, just because the parameter space is so huge. But they can learn to play in check. And also dynamicism in the parameter space, too, I would imagine. Right. So, can you define parameter space, please? For example, in, in this case, the parameter space is all the combinations, all the possible combinations of actions you can take. All the cylindrical commands, all the baking, all the acceleration commands. The, the Cartesian product of each of those. That is the, the parameter space. Your output parameter space. And your input, of course, in the all, all possible sensors. Combinations of sensors. Mm -hmm. Questions? Alright. Thank you very much.